Hello everyone and welcome to the program. Today we are going to be talking about the efficacy of enhanced recovery after surgery in perioperative temperature management. My name is Kelly Holsworth. I am a nurse here in Dallas, Texas. You also are going to be hearing from Dr. Reddy. He is a physician in Tennessee. These are listed disclosures. The program today is brought to you by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, an HMP global company. We also are supported by an educational grant from 3M Healthcare Medical Solutions Division. These are our learning objectives for today. First, before we get started, um, I wanna talk about what is ERAS. So ERAS stands for Enhanced Recovery After Surgery. To understand what we're going to be talking about today um, in regards to normothermia, you really need to understand what ERAS is and the principles of ERAS. So when we talk about ERAS, no matter what surgical specialty we are discussing, the pillars, the core principles remain the same. So you'll see a lot of these principles here in this um, word puzzle. So the ones that I want to point out to you are going to be evidence-based. This is huge. Um, ERAS is built on evidence-based principles, meaning that everything we do is intentional. Everything we do is research-based and driven. I also want to focus on multidisciplinary. Um, ERAS doesn't work with just one person. Um, it's not just a doctor or just a nurse. You really need the whole team. Um, and that focuses on people outside the hospital, like the doctor's offices, inside the hospital, and once the patient goes home. And most importantly, the patient. The patient is a member of the team. So if we want to talk about how um, ERAS is defined by the ERAS Society, they define ERAS as a multimodal perioperative care pathway designed to achieve early recovery for patients undergoing major surgery. So like I said, it's multimodal, it's multidisciplinary. This also focuses on surgical patients. So um, we're limiting our scope in that capacity. Also important to keep in mind, um, ERAS can be applicable to any surgery. However, urgent trauma cases, typically um, it's not gonna run the same way just because we don't have as much time um, to kind of, I guess, prehab the patient. ERAS represents a paradigm shift in perioperative care in two ways. First, it re-examines traditional practices, placing them with evidence-based practice when necessary. So we're no longer doing things the way we've always done it. We're doing things based on what the literature says. Secondly, it's comprehensive in its scope, covering all areas of the patient's journey in the surgical process. So like I mentioned earlier, we are covering the whole paradigm of care. So before the patient gets to surgery, pre-op, OR, post-op, discharge once they're home. If you see that picture on the right, you'll see the patient is at the center. That's vital. And you'll see all the different multidisciplinary personnel around them. So anesthesia, PT, OT, the nurses, dietitians, speech therapy. So now that we have the framework of what ERAS is, we're going to get into our topic today. So let's talk about normothermia within the ERAS program. When we talk about normothermia, what is that? A normothermic temperature zone is clinically defined as a core temperature between 36 degrees Celsius and 37.5 Celsius. That is 96.8 Fahrenheit to 99.5 Fahrenheit. So what is hypothermia? That is defined as a core body temperature below the 36 degree threshold. So below roughly 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So why does normothermia matter? Um, why is this something that is talked about? Um, it's been talked about for years. So we know that hypothermia occurs in about 70% of patients who undergo operations of two hours or more. So that's a vast majority of patients. We also know that adverse outcomes are related to perioperative hypothermia. Now, in today's discussion, when you hear um, the word perioperative, 
we're talking about the full patient journey. So um, that can be anywhere in their stay, pre-op, intra-op, post-op. Typically though, when we're talking about hypothermia, that's occurring in the intra-op phase. Now let's get into some of those adverse outcomes. So we know that hypothermia in the perioperative phase can lead to delayed recovery from anesthesia. So sometimes patients will have a harder time waking up from anesthesia. We know that it can lead to increased operative blood loss. Um, there's quite a bit of literature out there showing um, hypothermia related to needed blood transfusions. We know that hypothermia can increase the risk for surgical site infections. Um, you might hear the name SSIs. Um, again, that stands for surgical site infection. We know that there can be cardiac issues from hypothermia. We know that they can have a pro prolonged recovery. So that might lead to an increased length of stay. We know that they can have impaired blood glucose regulation, um, which basically what that looks like is they might have um, need for greater insulin. So we're gonna have a harder time controlling um, their blood sugar. We can have blood clotting issues and we can also have hospitalization depending on how bad it is. So these are just a few of the major adverse outcomes that can be caused by hypothermia. And like we said, we know that this occurs in 70% of patients who undergo operations that are two hours or more. So when we talk about what causes this, we know that it's a big deal, but what, what causes this? How does this happen? So intra-op hypothermia is a highly predictable post-induction reaction that's dominated by a redistribution of heat within the body. So what are the key things in this statement? It's highly predictable. We know that this is going to happen. So if we know this is going to happen, we need to be prepared and have an action plan. So what causes this exactly? This is caused by the anesthesia mediated decrease in systemic vascular resistance. So what exactly does that mean? That means that the drugs that are used by anesthesia are going to dampen the body's behavioral response to cold. So for example, if you or I are cold, we'll shiver and internally we'll have peripheral vasoconstriction. However, general and regional anesthesia induce peripheral vasodilation so that the body heat is diverted from the core to the periphery, risking further hypothermia. So you'll um, get more information about this. There's actually some great graphics that Dr. Reddy will go over um, to kind of show you exactly what that looks like. But what that means is our core, which is typically always warmer, now that blood is being shunted to our periphery. So the cold blood is just getting redistributed everywhere. So we're gonna talk about some additional risk factors with hypothermia. These are some things that um, basically the patient can have or environmental outcomes um, that can affect someone and have um, cause them to have a greatest, greater risk factor for hypothermia. So age, very young patients like children, elderly patients, patients undergoing a surgery greater than two hours. Like we said earlier, we know that 70% of patients are at risk for hypothermia if their surgery is over two hours. Um, and there's a lot of surgeries that fit within that category, especially um, X-laps, open procedures, cancer procedures, um, lysis of adhesion procedures. We know that patients that receive a large amount of IV fluids or blood are at greater risk for this as well. Patients that undergo abdominal surgery are at risk. This is especially true if this is an open procedure because you are exposed, your insides are exposed. When we use cold antiseptic skin preparation, um, that's another risk factor and that's gonna be applicable to a lot of patients. We know that the operating rooms are typically chilly. Um, again, this can be an increased risk factor. So we're gonna kind of now move into specifically normothermia within enhanced recovery. So I'm going to show you an image. Um, this image is a little bit busy, so I'll walk you through what you are seeing. So this first thing that you're seeing right here is a graph. On the left side of the graph, you're going to see all the different guidelines within enhanced recovery. So enhanced recovery, like I said, there are core guidelines. However, you also have um, your core recommendations within each 
specialty. So what I would kind of explain it as when you look specifically at this, you're going to see each different specialty where there's a written guideline. On the top, you'll see all the different um, temperature modalities and questions that we are wondering. So do the guidelines within these specialties say that there should be temp temperature monitoring um, or warming fluids or pre-warming? So next, what we're gonna look at is when you are looking at this image, you will see that bariatric surgery, you'll see that little red circle or oval around it. That is the only specialty that has no across the board. Now, the important thing to remember when you're looking at all of these yes and no's, no does not mean that no, you should not be doing it or that it is um, not recommended or prohibited. It simply means that there isn't um, really enough literature for them to say with strong evidence, this is necessary. Also keep in mind, ERAS is ever evolving as is healthcare, um, more and more, um, countries, states, facilities are implementing ERAS. So it will be interesting to see with time and more literature if that changes. The second thing to look at here is this column right here, prevent perioperative hypothermia. Every single one of these, except the bariatric, says yes. And remember, no doesn't mean that it's not important. It just means that we don't have literature to back our yes statement. So in all these specialties, Keeping the patients warm and making sure they're not hypothermic is of importance. On the far right, you'll see the recommendation grade. So again, this is strong. Every single one of them, except bariatric, where it's not applicable because we don't have the literature to prove it. This is strong evidence that this is very important and necessary. So as we move forward, we want to keep in mind that really no matter what the specialty, it's important that our patients are warm and how are we gonna do that and ensure that. So like I said, all of the specialties say it is important except bariatric right here where we're still learning and looking at the evidence. So important things to remember when we're talking about normothermia and the guidelines. When we say guidelines, that means um, kind of the suggestions, the playbook within each specialty. So each of those specialties that you saw on the left, for example, gynecology, oncology, there's guidelines for that specialty. Um, for colon rectal, there's guidelines for that specialty. And this serves um, as kind of a suggestion book or a playbook for physicians. So it's not gonna take away um, physician um, expertise. However, it's um, kind of a supporting document that we know is evidence-based, so it's the suggestion. <clears throat> so important things to consider when we're talking about normothermia. When we talk about children, like we said earlier, children are at an increased risk for hypothermia, and that's due to the greater body surface area to mass ratios. Um, they just are a different size than adults. The current recommendation for children, we want to consider two things, pre-warming, and warming fluids. Those are typically the two biggest things we'll do to warm patients. So when we talk about pre-warming in children, there is limited data. Um, so we really don't know. However, with the limited data that we have, um, some do suggest that if a patient, specifically a child, weighs more than 15 kilograms, pre-warming can be beneficial. When we talk about warming fluids in children, continuous warming um, of the uh, continuous fluids or the blood um, is typically unnecessary if that threshold for fluids is 30 milligrams per kilogram. If you get over that, you might reconsider, but the reason that they don't say that that's really necessary is because with that amount of fluids, if a child does get cold, you typically can combat that with the forced um, warm air and it would be a quicker recovery. So, We'll get into adults next. Most of the guideline recommendations and all the subspecialties within ERAS is gonna be focusing on adults. So everything we talk about moving forward um, is gonna be focused on our adult patients. So when we get into adults, we know that patient warming efforts are made to minimize the effects of post-induction redistribution 
minimize cutaneous heat loss and restore normothermia. So let's kind of break that down. We already talked about post-induction redistribution. So we know that that's, we know that that's going to happen. Remember we said that's not a surprising finding. We know that um, the subcutaneous and cutaneous heat loss that's caused from the patient being exposed. And we want to restore that um, normothermia. The current recommendations, um, this is where it kind of differs from children. So the therapeutic strategy differs depending on whether hypothermia is being prevented or treated. So is the patient already cold or do we know that we are expecting that um, due to just what we know happens with surgery and induction? Each of the three perioperative warming phases has a distinct purpose and must be handled differently. So when we get into these um, different stages of the perioperative, we're spoke, focusing specifically on um, kind of our OR phases. So preoperatively, intraoperatively, postoperatively. So we are gonna be talking about pre-op first, the guideline recommendations. We can see when we look at the literature that guidelines suggest that all patients that are scheduled for neuroaxial general or combined anesthesia should be pre-warmed with forced air warming device on its high temperature for at least 10 minutes. So when we talk about this, um, forced warming air devices, there's multiple different kinds, um, multiple different companies make these. Basically, this is something that is going to be blowing warm air on you. So typically what that looks like is the patient is gonna be wearing something um, Sometimes it kind of looks like a blanket. Other times it might look like um, similar to a gown, um, but it's hooked up to a device and it inflates and it's basically pushing warm air on the patient. We want that for at least 10 minutes. So what happens after the 10 minutes? After the 10 minutes, we don't want to necessarily turn it off. Um, they kind of have like an idle phase where it's just keeping the patient warm. But a lot of times patients really like these and they can control the heat. So um, let's say after 10 minutes, the patient says, oh my gosh, I'm really hot. Well, they can then lower the heat and cool it down, but we want at least 10 minutes of it on its high setting to get that patient really warm. We also want continuous core temperature monitoring. Um, so the reason for this is core temperature is what we're looking at. And if you remember earlier, earlier you'll see over here on the left side of the screen too, that's our um, temperature zones. We're talking about core temperature. It's also important um, to consider if you're using different temperature modalities, um, you're, you might have some variation. So for example, I came from a facility where we used um, oral temperatures in pre-op, we used core temperatures via you know, the endotracheal tube in surgery, and then we used oral temperatures in um, recovery. So the different modalities might just cause a little bit of variation in your temperature. So that's another important thing to consider. Now, when we talk about each phase of care, I wanna get into the why and the how are we doing this? So why are we pre-warming? How do we do it? What does that look like? So if we get into the why, pre-warming increases energy content of the body by elevating the mean body temperature, not the core temperature. So mean body temperature, if you see MBT, that's what that abbreviation stands for. So the goal of this, we're trying to transfer enough energy to prevent post-induction hypothermia without causing significant thermal discomfort or sweating. So like we said, the 10 minutes, that should get their temperature up. We're storing that energy. We know it's kind of, you know, when bears hibernate for winter, we know that we have it, we're storing it. And then if the patient's hot, we don't wanna cause discomfort so they can then turn it down, but we wanna make sure we've got enough energy and it's stored for that post-induction drop. So how does this work? What is this going to look like? This is gonna look like rapid and aggressive warming of the patient for a brief period. So like we said, it's that 10 minutes of the high intentional warming. Pre-warming requires the transfer of heat into the body by an active warming device. Um, so that's gonna be um, that gown or whatever the patient wears. So there's bear huggers, there's hot dog devices, whatever the device is, that's what we're using to force that warm air onto the patient. Minimizing heat loss from the skin is not sufficient. So giving the patient blankets um, or even warm blankets, that's not sufficient. That's not going to uh, be consistent heat 
Um, they're still going to see that drop. We need to be really intentional with using that forced warm air device. So the forced air warming device is an effective method for transferring heat onto the body because it can easily recruit substantial amounts of skin surface, meaning we're covering a lot of ground. So the devices cover the full body. So pretty much all areas of skin are gonna be getting some kind of warming. So if we move into the next phase, we're going into intra-op. So now we're talking about the patient has left the pre-op area and now they are in the OR. So what do the guidelines recommend for this phase of care? First and foremost, we wanna to try to limit the exposure time. So our goal is less than 10 minutes between pre-warming and induction. So between the patient being rolled into pre-op and they should still be wearing their um, warming device that goes with the patient, we're talking about taking that off, getting them prepped, cutting the patient induction. We want that less than 10 minutes if possible. A lot of times that can be a hefty goal. <laughs> especially depending on what the patient is having done. But the important thing to keep in mind is we want to try to be as, as efficient as possible um, while also maintaining safety. So um, we want to really kind of get our methods down because the longer that patient is exposed, the more chances of hypothermia we have. Our next recommendation, if we're giving fluids and that's um, like continuous fluids, that's blood, anything over one liter, we should be using some kind of warming device. All patients with anticipated anesthesia greater than 30 minutes should receive intraoperative forced warm air. So if they're gonna be under for greater than 30 minutes, which again, um, going to be a large amount of patients, they need to be using some kind of active warming device in the OR. So what we did in pre-op of intentionally warming them, we want to carry over to OR. Again, we see we want to continuously be monitoring their temperature. If we don't know the temperature and we're not looking at it, we don't know how we're doing. So it's very important that that's being done. So now let's get into the why and the how of the intra-op phase. So when we talk about intra-op, most of the temperature decreases that occur intraoperatively are because of redistribution. So that's that core temperature being warm, the periphery being a little bit cooler and the shunting of blood. Um, and now everything's kind of cool. Again, Dr. Reddy will get into this more a little bit later. A patient's body temperature can drop dangerously low in the first 30 to 40 minutes of being under anesthesia. So that's kind of, if we have our danger zone and the one that I guess the time period we want to be very cautious and be diligently monitoring. It's that it's um, phase right after induction, um, last 30 to 40 minutes after induction. When we talk about the how, intraoperative warming, meaning we're using that warming device in the OR, um, that transfers a small amount of heat into the body, but can reverse approximately 100 watts of heat loss. So um, it does what it needs to do quick and effectively. Warming limbs prevents these compartments from cooling warm, warm blood that flows from the core during circulation. So remember I said our core is typically warmer, our periphery is gonna be cold. So feet, legs, hands, arms, those are our periphery. Those are gonna be a bit cooler. So typically these warming devices, like I said, they're a gown or a blanket, they cover those areas. So when our body naturally shunts blood from core to periphery, instead of it going from warm to cool and then everything gets kind of cool, it's now warm to warm because we're warming the periphery. So we're keeping the whole body warm. Now, if we get into our post-op phase, what do the guidelines recommend for this phase of care? So we say the guidelines show us that surgical patients should be warmed until they're thermally comfortable and have a core temperature within normal range. So it's not one or the other, it's a package deal. The good thing about this is when we look at kind of the why behind this, typically we're trying to reverse the hypothermia that potentially was caused, but we do know that when you're hypothermic, you're typically a little bit uncomfortable. Um, so typically if a patient is hypothermic, they're gonna feel cold, they're not gonna feel great, they're gonna want blankets, they're gonna re um, request warming devices. 
Um, so we listen to what the patients say. So we're going to be monitoring their temperature. You'll see here that the continuous temperature monitoring is again recommended. Um, so we're going to be seeing what does um, the core temperature say? What do we know the patient is when we you know, look at the data of the thermometer? But also, what does the patient say? And typically, those go hand in hand. So typically, once we've achieved that um, normothermia, the warm, comfortable temperature, the patient will say they're comfortable. Obviously, if they have their bear hugger on, if they have their warming device on, you can leave that on. A lot of patients find that comfortable, but know if they get hot, you can take that off. You just want to make sure you're still monitoring their temperature. So now we'll kind of get into the summary of everything we just talked about. So first and foremost, we saw that continuous core temperature monitoring is vital in each phase of our perioperative journey. If for whatever reason in a facility that they don't have continuous measuring available, okay, we understand that that's not um, available everywhere. We still need to be making sure we're checking the temperature in some way. So if you can't continuously check, if that's not an automated um, kind of procedure, we need to make sure that at least every five to 10 minutes, um, 10 minutes max, we're checking the temperature. Someone's stopping to see what that is especially in that phase right after the induction phase, because that's kind of our danger zone. When we talk about pre-op, we said that all patients that are getting neuroaxial general or combined anesthesia should be pre-warmed with the forced warming air device at a high temperature for 10 minutes. So the patients that are gonna be under anesthesia, we wanna be intentional about pre-warming them. When we get into intra-op, if they have a surgery that is going to be longer than 30 minutes. If we know um, that they're getting anesthesia, we want to be diligent about our warming. So specifically, we want to limit the exposure time. We wanna to try to keep it less than 10 minutes. Um, we wanna to try to warm fluids if we're using greater than a liter. If we know that they're gonna be under anesthesia in greater than that 30 minutes, we want to make sure we're actively warming them in the OR phase. Post-op, we know that all surgical patients should be warmed until they're not only comfortable, but their core temperature is within normal range. So these are kind of the highlights of when we talk about normothermia within enhanced recovery. Again, this information that we just discussed can really be transferred in any subspecialty. So this is gonna be true if you're talking about um, gynecology, it's gonna transfer and still be true when we're talking about colon rectal. Um, next, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Reddy, um, and he is going to be going over the importance of the guidelines um, in ERAS and also in the perioperative patient when we talk about normothermia. Thank you, Ms. Holsworth, for that kind introduction. Once again, my name is V. Sinu Reddy. I'm a cardiac surgeon in Nashville, Tennessee at TriStar Centennial Medical Center. I serve as a national medical director for the Cardiovascular Service Line at HCA. And I'm also on the board of directors of the Enhanced Recovery After Cardiac Surgery. Today, we're going to talk about enhanced recovery after surgery and the importance of guidelines to improve care in the perioperative patient. Specifically, for those of us as not familiar with enhanced recovery, longstanding dogma has ruled for a very long time. Let me take you back to the past. Senior surgeons, for example, had very strong principles, which were assumed as dogma. These included prolonged fasting before an operation very rigid mechanical bowel preparation regimens, nasogastric tubes for prolonged periods of time after an operation. And these were thought to be necessary to empty the bowel through catharthics or hyperosmolar oral hydration uh, to prevent intraoperative contamination, to prevent early passage of bowel content through an anastomotic suture line while it was healing. Drainage tubes were kind of de rigueur and standard and believed to be essential after any kind of operation. Prolonged bed rest was often a modality of recovery rather than early ambulation as we do now. And stage diet advancement was also part of the dogma. You had to start with sips of chips of ice, then move on to clear liquids, then full liquids, and finally solid food prior to being discharged. And finally, cold temperatures were thought to actually reduce bacterial count and was the standard procedure in many operating rooms as well as in the post-op recovery areas. But fortunately, evidence always trumps dogma. And the ERAS Society, which is Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Society, was formed in 2001 by Dr. Ken Fearon and Dr. Ali Lundquist, uh, 
after they met in London at a symposia that was actually dedicated towards perioperative nutrition. And they decided to start a collaborative group on various facets of perioperative care. A couple of years later, in 2003, the first ERAS symposia was held in Stockholm. And in 2005, the ERAS study group started developing and publishing evidence-based consensus protocols for patients undergoing specifically colonic surgery at that time. Here in our own country in 2016, myself and a group of um, like-minded, forward-thinking cardiothoracic surgeons and anesthesiologists got together to form enhanced recovery after surgery cardiac. The goal was to develop a, uh, protocols around perioperative care to really improve and enhance the recovery through research, guideline development, education, and implementation of evidence-based practices. In cardiac surgery, uh, previously, this was known as fast-track surgery. This was evidence-based multimodal interventions under kind of a single program rubric, which is applied to the care of the surgical patient. Initially, this was developed and promulgated for colorectal surgery, but this quickly caught on in many other specialties. It was directed at targeting the impact of surgery on metabolic and endocrine responses and trying to reduce complications without increasing readmissions. The nice thing about this and for all enhanced recovery is that it's a multidisciplinary team with representatives from all specialties involved in patient care. While nutrition and fluid management plays a central role in enhanced recovery after surgery, uh, more recently, opioid reduction and multimodal analgesia were introduced and have become a real mainstay, particularly in enhanced recovery after cardiac surgery. Well, why would someone want to implement enhanced recovery? Well, we know there can be up to a 30 to 40% reduction in the actual hospital at the stay. There could be a market decrease in, well, in surgical as well as even non-surgical complications through glycemic control and reduction of infections in that early post-operative period. Enhanced recovery has also been associated with an earlier return to work and productivity in the patients, which really results in improved patient satisfaction. And patient reported outcomes are becoming more and more important and actually may be required by some payers. As well as in developed and developing countries, we've seen a reduction in healthcare costs incurred when ERAS protocols are followed. And finally, institutions themselves benefit because it streamlines patient care. The earlier discharge, reduction in turnover times, may actually allow certain institutions to serve more patients with the available infrastructure. Well, how does ERAS work? Let's look in this uh, pictogram, looking at the left side and the right side. On the left side, if you look at the functional status of the patient on the uh, y-axis and time across the x-axis, you will find that in general, what happens is you have a pre-existing state of the patient. The patient takes quite a big dip during the operative uh, phase and then reaches an nadir, and it's a very slow upward climb back to some functionality, which may not quite be back to the optimum point. In a ERAS type approach, we actually look at the pre-operative period as a very important period of making an intervention. We try to get the patient from a baseline up to a higher level of functioning. Then with the operation, the nadir is not quite as low and a much quicker, steeper slope to recovery takes place, resulting in the patient reaching an optimum level of recovery uh, much faster and actually much closer to what is optimum. Well, what are key components of enhanced recovery? There are quite a few. If you look in the preoperative period, it can range from everything from education to early discharge planning to carb loading instead of fasting, uh, really being selective about bowel prep, being meticulous about prophylaxing for uh, throm uh, thrombosis, particularly deep venous thrombosis, being very uh, purposeful in the way antibiotics are uh, administered, and actually pre-warming the patient. Active uh, patient involvement is very key to all of ERAS. Intraoperatively, this may involve things like opioid sparing techniques, minimally invasive approaches to surgery, actively warming the patient, and avoiding unnecessary tubes and drains. We also want to be, have both during the intraoperative and postoperative period, very meticulous and directed perioperative fluid management and management of pain and nausea with actual prevention of these rather than treating them. In the postoperative phase, one of the key ten tenants is early introduction of nutrition, early catheter removal, making sure the patient moves, things like chewing gum to prevent ileus, and already defining the discharge criteria so the patient can actively participate in that. Finally, it's very important with any enhanced recovery program to audit the compliance of the program and what the outcomes that are being achieved. And it's very, very important to have whole team involvement. 
What are some challenges one might face in ERAS implementation? Well, certainly traditional doctrine and uh, dogma are still very strong, and it can be really slow to implement uh, ERAS guidelines, particularly in certain settings. If it's a large institution that already has set pathways, it may be very difficult to introduce new pathways of perioperative and postoperative care. Other barriers may exist in certain institutions, such as actual lack of nursing staff, or what I find very important and critical to the whole mission is a coordinator. It's so important to have a coordinator of enhanced recovery that allows the institution to make sure that audit function occurs. And this may be directly related to financial resources. Oftentimes, ERAS can be implemented but falls apart because of lack of communication, a loss of collaboration, or a transition among teams. There's always constant turnover in any large hospital between nursing teams, respiratory teams, nutritional teams. It's a natural evolution that some of these personnel who are the champions and uh, are very um, excited about ERAS may transition out or move up due to promotions. So it's very important that new team members are always cultivated and uh, taught about enhanced recovery and practice it. Finally, many times the surgeons themselves are not willing to change their practice, but fortunately our anesthesia colleagues may be more forward looking and they may help us with certain elements of it, particularly the fluid management uh, during an operation, helping us uh, achieve better analgesia with the uh, regional blocks uh, and also timing of medications such as antibiotics and antiemetics. So just to recap, what was ERAS and how did it become developed? It was really uh, developed to highlight the importance of perioperative care. And it's already demonstrated the ability, number one, achieve a reduced hospital stay. It's been able to improve patient satisfaction. Enhanced recovery has reduced rates of complications without a coincident increase in readmission rates. And finally, we understand that until enhanced recovery becomes routine reality, it may be in the best interest of all of uh, those of us involved in perioperative care to at least become familiar with it and its principles and until it becomes an opt-out type feature in all perioperative service lines. So now I wanna shift gears and focus a little bit more specifically on normothermia and review what is the latest in terms of guidelines as well as recommendations from enhanced recovery after surgery. So first of all, if we look at Medicare, we know there has been uh, an accelerated focus by Medicare as a payer on value and outcomes. If you look at this slide on the upper left-hand side, 2014, less than 5% of the population was in any sort of population-based alternative payment plan or even in a fee-for-service that was linked to quality, maybe only 20%. As recently as 2016, if fee-for-service being linked to quality is now exploded to 85% and population-based alternative payments jumped to 30%. And now 2018, and as we move on into 2021 and 2022, those components of the diagram only grow. Uh, Population-based alternative payments are going to become the vast majority now in 2021 is directed under new Medicare guidelines, as well as the linkage of quality. Another way to look at this, if you look at transparency and performance outcomes, this is also going to become very, very important. We know that SSIs, which are surgical site infections, and catheter-related infections or central line-related bloodstream infections are very costly. You can see the cost ranges from 20000 to as high as 45000 And we know that a simple readmission may be as much as 13000 and the simple development of a pressure ulcer could be a $70,000 problem. All of these are being monitored and are, in fact, directed to be never events in a hospital. So ERAS really are solutions designed to help reduce the risk of this, these preventable complications and readmissions, thereby really helping to manage the total cost of care. One of those areas is understanding and being purposeful about perioperative warming to prevent hypothermia. There are multiple societies around the world that have developed evidence-based guidelines for this. Two of them, just two of them, are those here in this country. The uh, Association of Operating Room Nurses and Registered Nurses, which is AORN, has made a very purposeful guideline in 2019 that says all surgical patients to, are to receive some form of hypothermia prevention. And if you look at the American College of Surgeons, uh, their dictate says the use of preoperative warming prior to short, clean cases has been shown to reduce both surgical site infections and other complications and is recommended. So whether we look at any of the North American uh, societies, uh, as you see here on this map, 
the European societies, including the World Health Organization or Asian societies, all of them are in agreement that hypothermia is to be avoided. Patient normothermia standardization is an important part of enhanced recovery. And there are protocols that can leverage evidence-based guidelines. Let's look for a minute at some of these. We know that all adult patients scheduled for any kind of procedure, whether it's a neuraxial, regional, or general combined anesthetic should receive pre-induction warming with convective air for at least 10 minutes. There should be a reduction in the time between the end of pre-warming and the actual induction of anesthesia. Intraoperative warming with convective air uh, should be performed with cases with anticipated durations of greater than 30 minutes, which really is the vast majority of cases. Fluid warming, if more than one liter of fluid is to be administered to the patient, should be taking place. And post-operative warming until patients are normothermic, which remember normothermia greater than 36 degrees Celsius up to 37.5 degrees Celsius and thermally comfortable is indicated. And finally, the actual monitoring of continuous core temperatures should be performed uh, for the whole perioperative journey. That's the preoperative uh, period in the prep and recovery area, intraoperatively, of course, and then postoperatively. And this is based on published guidelines from, again, a variety of organizations. So what's the importance of maintaining normothermia? Well, the problem is hypothermia. It's very, very easy for a patient to become hypothermic. Typically, the very core, as you see on the left side, stays warm, but the body itself, due to the cooling effect of the air surrounding the patient, can very quickly cool the patient down and then also take the core temperature down. So the problem of hypothermia is very common. And there's a fact that it occurs in up to 90% of patients unless it's very purposefully and directly recognized and treated, therefore preventing other complications of surgery. What's the characteristic pattern of general anesthesia-induced hypothermia? Well, let's take a look at it. First of all, we know that core temperature can drop 1.6 degrees Celsius in the first hour of anesthesia. And why? It's because anesthesia itself causes vasodilation, allowing the warm blood from the core of the body to freely mix with the colder blood in the periphery. 81% of this happens because the temperature decrease due to core to peripheral head distribution is actually being caused by the very anesthetic agents. And this redistribution uh, temperature drop is known as RTD. You can see on the graph to the center right of this slide, that it doesn't take very long, that in the first hour itself is the sharpest drop, but the drop continues until a plateau is reached up to hour four. So most cases which run about four hours, you're gonna see a significant drop of up to three to four degrees in body temperature. It's a rapid decrease, then there's a slow linear decline, followed by a temperature plateau that's probably not really reached till hour five of the in the operating room. Well, let's take a look at the negative outcomes of inadvertent perioperative hypothermia. Again, let's remember that hypothermia is defined as core temperature less than 36 degrees. And we should also remember that even mild hypothermia can have very significant adverse events and negative outcomes. Number one, increased rate of wound infection can occur. Number two, we can see increased rates of mortality. Number three, very important in the cardiac surgical field, coagulopathy. Uh, requiring, again, blood transfusion and product transfusion. Number four, a prolonged and altered drug effect. Many times as the metabolic rate goes down, coincident with the temperature going down, it may take longer for the body to process and metabolize and excrete or secrete the drugs that we are providing to the patient during the anesthetic period. Another area that can be quite hazardous to the patient is the development of myocardial ischemia due to demand ischemia or due to cardiac disturbances such as arrhythmias. Shivering and thermal discomfort. Let's face it, if there's a patient, it's never comfortable to be cold. And finally, a delay in actual emergence from anesthesia, again, related to the fact that the metabolic rate may be much lower. Maintaining normothermia can, on the other hand, reduce the risk of complications associated with even mild hypothermia. Let's look at some of this. If you start at the upper left, there can be an, we know that $66 a minute is the average cost of time in the operating room. And that pre-warming helps maintain normothermia, thereby 
Warming the patient reduces the amount of time needed to stay in the operating room to rewarm the patient. Next, $203. That's the mean acquisition cost to a hospital for one unit of blood. We know that maintaining normothermia will reduce surgical bleeding and the need for blood products, not just packed red blood cells, but also cryoprecipitate, platelets, and uh, FFP. And that mild hypothermia, even of one degree centigrade, can increase blood loss by 16% and thereby increase transfusion rates by up to 22%, $25,000. This is the average cost of a surgical site infection. And we know that normothermia can reduce the risk of surgical wound infection. And wound rates have been shown to be much higher for hypothermic patients than for normothermic patients. It's very simple. The vessels are vasoconstricted. There's not adequate blood flow to a site that's been injured through the trauma of surgery. And with peripheral vessels that are vasoconstricted, you won't have delivery of antibiotics, nutrients, and blood to that area, resulting in ischemia or relative ischemia and thereby higher rates of wound infection. $14 is the average cost of cotton blankets per surgical patient. So it's not that uh, inexpensive to start some methodology to start rewarming the patient and looking at an average cost per inpatient day, $1,600. We know that hypothermic patients' actual duration of hospitalization can be up to 20% longer than in normothermic patients. So maintenance of normothermia can really shorten the overall length of stay. And finally, the average cost per anesthesia unit. We know, again, maintaining normothermia is much more uh, cost-effective and less expensive than trying to recover from this and achieve normothermia after hypothermia. If you look at it another way in these curves, the fastest way to change mean body temperatures through forced air convective means. So there are many ways to do it. Certainly airway heating and humidification are important. Blankets are important. More blankets can be important if there's um, significant hypothermia. Certainly keeping some contact of a uh, circulating water mattress can help. But one of the best ways to do it, and the more rapid ways to do it, is having a forced air total body convection system. Convective and conductive systems warm the patient. They can both be effective, but they do it in different ways. Some of the key things to recognize is conductive warming can sometimes have pressure points or regions that it warms. If you look in the front and the back, the, it basically warms where the pads are applied to the body versus convective utilizing warm air really warms up the periphery where a lot of the uh, hypothermia is taking place. It also warms evenly both to the front and the back and um, can be very effective and very quick. But both systems can work. Both systems are important along with adjunctive things like warming the fluids that we're actually administering to the patient. We know that 20% of the body surface area can be recruited to help with the warming. And we have to be very cautious with some systems because the clinician has to ensure direct sensor contact. And we need to make sure that any reusable components have to be cleaned between usage. Here's some data here. The, what is the effective, uh, effectiveness of preoperative warming on intraoperative hypothermia? This randomized controlled trial was conducted. The objective was to look at the effects of forced air pre-warming on intraoperative hypothermia. The methods they used was elective surgery patients were randomized to at least 30 minutes of pre-warming with some type of bear hugger type gown. And the control group was just warmed cotton blankets, roughly matched group, 99 in one, 101 in the other. And through, this was used throughout the uh, perioperative period, the, the uh, bear hugger type system, which is a convective heating system. And the primary outcome was the magnitude of hypothermia measured as an area under the curve, meaning for temperatures under 36 degrees. And you can see very easily here that the results that the magnitude of hypothermia was significantly lower in the pre-warmed group. So the whole concept here is that you prevent hypothermia rather than play catch up and try to treat, treat it. Other assessments made in the pre-warm group were that there was a lower incidence of hypothermia. In other words, they didn't get cold. There was a lower duration. If they did get hypothermic, the time that they were hypothermic or that time under the curve was much smaller. And that there was a higher temperature on those pre-warm patients when they reached the post-acute uh, recovery area. Delay in initiating warming in the OR was an average of 40 minutes. And this caused significant increases in the area under the curve. And we know that each minute uh, of delay increases the odds of hypothermia by about 5%. So both the warming process and any product that you use work together to reduce perioperative hypothermia. And the conclusion reached in this study was that a minimum of 30 minutes of preoperative forced air warming decreased the overall intraoperative hypothermic exposure. 
And that's why it's so important to include the recognition and the treatment of hypothermia before you ever enter the operating room. So really, if we wanna summarize all of this in, in one slide, what we've covered, both the concept of enhanced recovery and then also the concept of understanding and preventing hypothermia, it would be this. Hypothermia, I think we've shown, is an often under-recognized entity in the perioperative patient. And that hypothermia can start an hour or two hours before the actual procedure because the patient is typically taken out of their um, room that they may be in the hospital or nor their normal um, setting, brought into a setting where it's typically the thermostat is quite cool and that they're left with very little covering. And during that time, the body starts to cool off, particularly the periphery. As we saw, the core temperature may be maintained, but the periphery becomes much cooler, resulting in a very quick drop of then core temperature once the patient is brought to an even colder room, which is typically the operating room. Number two is that our previous understanding of what hypothermia was, that it could be as simple as just 36 degrees Celsius and its coincident adverse consequences were really poorly understood until more recent research has looked into this. We know that hypothermia in the perioperative period will increase compl complications, and that's all complications, not just related to hypothermia directly, but things like wound infections, things like time of recovery from anesthetics, and that it will prolong the overall postoperative recovery. Finally, we understand now that current guidelines dictate pre-warming, that you don't wanna chase your tail and be treating hypothermia. What's better to do, the better technique, and the technique more in line with enhanced recovery is to pre-warm the patient and make sure they come into the operating room at a good both core temperature and peripheral temperature, and that we can address hypothermia with a multitude of strategies, both active and passive warming techniques, which we've briefly talked about here. Simple active measures to avoid and treat hypothermia and restore normothermia are really critical components of this whole concept of enhanced recovery after any kind of surgery, whether it's colorectal, it's GYN, it's orthopedics, uh, bariatric, or in my own specialty of cardiovascular surgery. And in the current area, the era, this should really be the fundamental way in which we approach patients. And finally, ongoing research is needed to determine the best and most targeted manner in which to prevent and treat hypothermia. In other words, we don't have all the answers today, but we do know that prevention of hypothermia is important, treating hypothermia is important, but there may be better and novel ways that we can all come up with to achieve this. I wanna thank everybody for their attention uh, for this seminar tonight, and uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you.